the radio man was back in the waist at the time we were hit, and I was in the tail, and the tail blew off the airplane, knocked me out. The bombardier got blown out of the nose at the same time. He went straight out over his uh, bomb site. We were on the bomb run, and the radio man happened to be back in the waist at the time helping the waist gunner who had gotten airsick his first mission and he'd thrown up in his oxygen mask, so I suppose he was scared. And uh, he passed out and the radio man got out through the escape door, just as it exploded. They knocked down three planes. Eight missions you were lucky, 10 somebody up there like you, 25 was almost an impossibility. The plane blew up, and I got knocked out. Welcome to Air Combat Journal. Today's journal entry is from World War II B-17 tail gunner, Wes Borgeson. This is your pilot, John Sermon, asking you to sit tight and strap in. Air Combat Journal is ready for takeoff. Going to war. I was drafted when I was 18. In November, I was sworn in December 16, 1943, and uh, I went into cadets. The program was closed down, and I went to gunnery school. Then I went to Tampa, Florida, where I was assigned to training detachment in Gulfport Field, Mississippi. And I was shipped there as a replacement tail gunner on a crew that was already halfway through their training. So instead of having three months overseas training with the crew, I had six weeks. Uh, we finished training in, uh, again, November, we went overseas and uh, on the ship. Going overseas by sea rather than by air. Left New York on October 31st of 19, 44, and we didn't have a navigator, so we didn't have an airplane to fly over. I got off the ship at Greenwich, Scotland, November 11th, 1944. We all went down to Stone, England for assignment, and we were assigned to the 384th Bomb Group in Grafton Underwood near Kettering, in England, about 80 miles north of London, and uh, flew my first mission November 27th, and my last mission November 30th. <laughs> so I flew a total of one and a half missions. Almost reassigned as a ball turret gunner. They were halfway through, so, but I got, as a member of the crew, I was accepted pretty, pretty readily and uh, they wanted to make me a ball turret gunner because I was uh, a little guy. And I said, no, I'm in a sign, transferred here to be assigned to as a tail gunner. And that's where I want to be, is on the tail. A tail gunner's responsibilities. Well, the main responsibility was just to shoot anybody that came up from behind. And as it turned out, uh, the tail end of the war like that, or the tail end of our bombing. Uh, the Germans didn't have many fighter airplanes in the air at that time, so as it turned out, uh, I never saw a German airplane until I was a POW. And uh, the guns and the tail would not move very far. Uh, the old tail was about, uh, would only move 13 degrees each way and the elevation a little bit more. And the new tail that I, was actually in when I shot down, uh, would move a little farther, but mostly we were, sh we'd shoot a, a, a gun. Uh, I had twin 50, one, one twin 50 in each hand mounted on a pivot. And so they were basically handheld on a pivot and uh, you swung together and then I had a, a ring sight out the window that I uh, would shoot at or use. The intense cold in the tail compartment. 
It was cold back there because the B-17 at that time was, there was no heat. And they had a heat pipe back there, but by the time the air got from the front to the back, why it was all cold anyhow, so it was just a cold draft all the time. And so it was colder than the devil back there, and uh, uh, we had a heated suit, and uh, our gloves had wires through them, so we had heated gloves, and then we wore little things inside our boots that were sort of like a, a slipper that had to, uh, heater, heating line in them, and we had that, and then a little thermostat on the side, you could adjust the temperature, so you could warm it up or cool it off. But uh, the top of your head would get colder than hell. I mean, you just, you'd sit there shivering, and uh, so you really didn't keep very warm. You were kneeling on uh, like a two by four, it was a wood, and it was padded, uh, just a little bit of padding, and I don't know if it was foam rubber or what it was, but you're kind of halfway needling, and then you sat back on a wooden seat that was a little bit of padding on it, and it was shaped like a bicycle seat, sort of, so you just could sit on that, but if you were actually had to be firing your guns, why, you'd have to kneel up and get up off that seat, kind of. You would be just kneeling down. And uh, the first mission I flew, I think, was six hours. And uh, I went down on my second mission, and I think we were in the air sort of like uh, four hours or something already, and we had just reached the target. So it would have been about an eight-hour mission. So you sit there manning your guns for that amount of time. Getting up to stretch. The first mission, uh, no, I, I sat there the whole time. And see, we were flying high altitude nearly all the time. We didn't drop, drop altitude until we came over the channel. So you had to be connected to your uh, oxygen mask all the time. I guess on the way back, we get into France, uh, and uh, see, France, uh, we had already invaded then, but we'd, we'd sometimes get up and walk around after we were over France on the way home. The B-17's restroom, not. We didn't have any. Well, I know that. <laughs> yeah. That's uh, joke. No, we had a, what they called a relief tube in the back. And if it didn't freeze up, if you used it very much, it would freeze up. But uh, I, I remember probably using it maybe two or three times, and maybe once in gunnery school, and once on our first mission. Feelings of fear or apprehension? No, it didn't enter your mind. You just kind of had a job to do, and I didn't know enough about maybe the danger we were in. And so uh, I, I really w was never really particularly a apprehensive or anything, no. You think the odds are that you're going to finish your missions, you probably will be hit, and somebody will be cr hurt in your crew, probably. But the odds were reasonable at that time that you would finish your mission. Now, see, there were German fighters were not too much in the air at that time, because our uh, P-51s were taking off from France, so they would go almost to the target with us, but they wouldn't go over the target because of the flak. The Germans didn't have many fighters because we were bombing synthetic oil refineries, and uh, the first mission was down near France, and where France and Germany joined way down near Switzerland. We were bombing a rail yard there. And the day I was shot down, we were bombing a synthetic oil refinery. So the Germans uh, didn't have a lot of fighters and stuff in the air. And so uh, they could have just as well left the gunners off toward the end of the war, because there was nothing to shoot at. So we, we had a good chance of finishing our missions without getting shot down, although most people wouldn't. 
be able to finish their missions, and I had no thought of being shot down. A typical mission day. We would get up. I think they'd come around and wake you up about 2.30 in the morning. And uh, this was England in November. And uh, you'd eat, fall out, and eat breakfast. At uh, The crews would fall out, and then we'd eat breakfast about 3 o'clock. And then go out for, a sh after the breakfast, we'd show up for briefing, and we'd have briefing for a while. And then we would take off. We'd check our airplane and check our guns out. And each uh, gunner had his own uh, insides of a gun. So you kept those up or make sure they weren't rusting or anything. And, oil them and so when we pick up our drums you'd dry them out uh, wipe all the oil off so they wouldn't jam I had my own guns that are the guts of a gun that for the tail and then you put them in the tail and make sure they worked and hooked up and uh, you had a push button to fire them and so you they wouldn't test fire your guns at that time we didn't test fire our guns and even once you took off, it used to be in the out, when they took off, you would test fire your guns when you got in the air. <clears throat> but they cut that out because uh, we'd fly such close formations that the brass would be dropping off and hit the airplanes behind, be picked up by the radial engines. And uh, so there were too much damage to the airplanes. So we never even test fired. I never fired around ammunition overseas. The second mission, a 1,200 plane raid. We, we were well into Germany, just uh, south of Leipzig, about uh, 35 or 40 miles, uh, at a little town called Zeitz, and we were bombing a synthetic oil refinery, and uh, we had flying, we'd flown our first mission, like I said, down near France and Belgium, or France, uh, and Switzerland, and uh, we got a piece of flak through the nose in that one, and it didn't didn't hurt anything. It just uh, went through the uh, nose, and uh, so we were a little apprehensive because uh, the Germans were putting a lot of flak up, but there were no airplanes to fly. So, uh, and the mission further in, we were flying high. The bombing altitude was t <clears throat> briefed as 27,500 feet, and the anti-aircraft uh, uh, would only uh, the, the the 90 millimeter that was a famous anti-aircraft gun would not shoot over about 22,000, and our bombing altitude was 27,500. So it was the 105s, but around the con the, these main tar targets, there was a lot of flak. And the, uh, 105, the 105s would shoot up to about 27,000 or 25,000 or a little higher. And we were flying 27,500. But uh, there was a lot of flak up there. There was actually, the Air, 8th Air Force had uh, 1,200 airplanes up that day, and they lost 27 from any aircraft. And our group, I think, lost four airplanes. We had 36 up, uh, a high and low lead squadron, and there were 12 planes in each one of the squadrons. And uh, I think uh, four of the 384th bomb group planes were shot down that day. Hit at 27,500 feet and on fire. We were hit behind number three air, uh, three engine on the right side. It's the inboard engine on the right side. And it hit a gas tank and it blew gasoline into the bomb bays. As you know, the, the wings opened into the bomb bays and there, the wings in a B-17 were real thick. And when the gasoline went into the bomb bays, the bomb bay doors were open, we were on the bomb run, and 
the air coming in, uh, the, radio, the door between the bomb bay and the radio room was open and the gasoline came pouring through the waste, or through into the waste through the bomb, uh, radio man, radio room, and the radio man was back at the waste because, the, again, the waste gunners had almost passed out from the, uh, he'd thrown up in his auction mask and the radio man went back to help him. So he got caught in the fire and the fire must have burned intensely for just a very short time, probably a few seconds. And, uh, <clears throat> and then the airplane blew. And I remember being by my escape hatch, which was on the right side of the airplane, right under the horizontal stabilizer. And there's a door about two feet square. And as I remember, I was back by that door and the whole back end was on fire. And the side of my face was really hot. And uh, I had pulled the pins on the door and the door was supposed to fly open in the slipstream, but it didn't. And apparently I kicked at the door and right then it was burning, burning badly and then apparently the plane exploded and I probably hit my head on something and knocked me out because that's, I remember being back by that escape hatch and pulling the pins on the on the uh, thing and kick, kicking at the door to get it popped open and that's all I remember. The plane blew up and I got knocked out and apparently I came down in the tail section. The tail blew off, the right wing blew off and the bombardier when it exploded, but was blown out the nose. He went straight out over the nose, and he was on the bomb run, so I think he took the bomb site out with him because uh, when he was interrogated, he was asked whether he had gotten uh, damaged the bomb site, but I've got the record of the German evaluation of that crash and his bomb site was never found. It didn't end up with the wreckage. So apparently, when he went out the nose, he took the bomb site with him. He said he didn't he didn't destroy it, but apparently, when he went out on the bomb, uh, he went right straight out the nose. I think when it exploded, it probably blew the whole uh, plexiglass nose off because he had a chute on and he opened a chute and he got out. And the navigator who sits on the left side of the airplane, on the pilot side, and he's got a station there and a gun there and a gun out, a flexible gun, which they hardly ever used. And uh, he went out and I think probably, once we were on the bomb and he had his parachute on and he had a backpack, he wasn't a regular bombardier or regular navigator we had and they found him away from the airplane and his chute had never opened and he had an injury across his stomach so all I can think of is he, he went out the side of that thing and he, he probably hit the propeller and the propeller killed him because it, apparently he, he never opened his chute and his, he was found in Germany with his chute unopened. There's a guy in there. Being in the tail section of the plane when I hit the ground, I uh, was knocked out and uh, uh, there was a French POW that worked on that farm in that area and they had pretty much the run of these farms because we were away in central Germany and uh, the uh, uh, French were, would had pretty much have the freedom to go on the farm. They had to herd cattle and take the cow cattle home and milk cows and they were slave laborers basically and there's a Frenchman came over and looked at the tail because and they had a guard standing there near that area because they had trouble with the German kids shooting these machine guns because these were live machine guns and 50 caliber and these teenagers or pre-teenagers would go out and shoot these 50 caliber machine guns for the hell of it so they posted a guard of the home Volkstrom the home army he came out and they went over by the tail and 
chased the kids away and uh, they heard me groaning in the tail. And they said, hey, there's a guy in there. And they hauled me out and uh, put me in this jail cell because when my radio man came in, they put him in the same jail cell and I was lying on a stretcher out like a rock. And uh, he said my face was pretty well burned and uh, my jacket was burned and Jerry's jacket was worse than mine even. And he was burned base because he was up in the waist where there's more fire. And uh, they took my parachute bag out of the tail and there was another jacket in there and he that was a jacket we wore in England. It was a kind of a quilted jacket and it had a hood on it. He pulled that out of my parachute bag and that was his jacket while he was a POW. Floating down in the tail from 27,000 feet. I think it probably broke off where that back door is, where there's escape hatch, which is right in front of there. And of course, all I can think is that the horizontal stabilizers on the tail are about equal to the wingspan of a P-47 and then that great big vertical thing and it was probably unbalanced enough and it spiraled down or flew down like a leaf or fluttered down or something but apparently it wasn't going at any speed that when it landed it hit it just uh, I don't know how it landed whether it landed on one of the fins and that was absorb some of the shock or what but I was out for, uh, I think it was about, I didn't wake up, I think, for four or five days. The radio operator's injuries. He uh, was burned pretty badly, but he ended up in the same, actually when we were shot down, he, he got out and uh, fought his flak suit on the way down. He got the hell out of there as quick as he could and you're supposed to pull a little tab on your flak suit and it's supposed to drop away. Well, his didn't drop away. And he had to fight his flak suit because he had his parachute hanging under the flak suit and he, had to, he couldn't fasten the chest side. So he had it hooked on one side and hanging down under his arm. And he fought his flak suit off and he finally got it off and he looked down at the ground and he thought, well, it's pretty close. And uh, so he had his hands burned pretty badly because he'd been back trying to help the waste gunner uh, fix up his, put a new oxygen mask on him. And uh, so he didn't have his gloves on and his hands were burned pretty badly, but he was able to open his parachute and he looked down and he said, I better not hook up the other side. Uh, we're getting pretty close, so he pulled the rip cord. He got his hands were burned, so he had to get he fed it out by hand. It didn't pop out, and it just blossomed out, and he hit the ground. And uh, a German farmers come over with pitchforks were coming at him after he hit the ground, and <clears throat> he saw another German soldier coming at him, and he thought, well. The soldier had a gun and that he would be better off with the soldier than he would with the civilians. So he walked toward the soldier and uh, the soldier, uh, he, was, he was, again, his face had been burned pretty badly and his, his uh, uh, suit was off and he shed his harness and this guard came up with him and grabbed his jacket and just gave it a perk and it was all burned his back had been burned and his face was burned and uh, the sleeve uh, so his jacket just fell apart so uh, he got they hauled him off with this guard took him to a jailhouse in that little town called Muselwitz and uh, Jerry uh, got to this, the, there was a jail in there and they put him in the jail and I was there lying on a stretcher and uh, uh, they uh, we were in that little jail for overnight and the next day 
they hauled my radio man and I in a horse and wagon. It probably they had a lot of rubber tire wagons that they used horses on. And I was lying flat on my back on there and I hadn't come to yet or anything. And the radio man was there. And he said, as we're going along, being a farm boy from North Dakota, why I sat up by, and yed, yelled, whoa, whoa. And of course, the German horses don't understand. That doesn't, they, to stop a German horse, you just begin, brrrr. That's how you, that's whoa in German. <laughs> and uh, so the horses didn't stop, so my radio man pushed me down and said, shut up and be quiet now. And uh, they hauled us and dumped us to an infirmary. The bombardier goes to the officer's POW camp, and the crew is separated. No, well, he was an officer, and he went to the officer's camp. And the radio man, who had been burned pretty badly, when we evacuated our prison camp, they stuck me back in the hospital. And Jerry, who was my radio man, he said I could have gone with him. They sent him by rail to Stalag Luft 1, which was the officer's camp. But I decided to, I didn't, he said, well, you wouldn't go. And I don't remember any of this, but I see the radio man said that. And then after the war, he lived at Meridian, Mississippi, and I actually visited him. To wear your parachute or do not wear your parachute? He, yeah, he had a chest pack, and I think, I think he went on the bomb run, and we normally put our parachutes on when we're on the bomb run. Uh, I didn't. I had mine sitting right beside me, and uh, because in the tail you have to lean forward, and uh, it, it affects how you can handle your guns. It would get in the way of these flexible guns. And so I choose not to have it on. Last recollections prior to the explosion and passing out. Really, I don't remember any other than it being all on fire and being back by the door. And uh, then I think I was, uh, with the lack of auction, it was probably a few minutes that I was off the auction mask. And so at uh, you know, 27,000 feet, or maybe we dropped a little bit, but at that altitude, you don't stay conscious any more than a few seconds or parts of a minute because you're drawing in and you're not, you're not hooked to an auction line. Why, uh, you just, when you breathe out, you breathe out what oxygen is in your chest and you pass out pretty fast. And I think, uh, I just remember being back by the escape hatch and uh, kicking at the door, and then it apparently exploded about that time. Medical treatment in the POW camp. And my doctor in the prison camp was Dr. Leslie Kaplan. And if you wanted to look up a story, in 1946, he wrote an article, Death March Medic, because when he left the prison camp, he got shot down as a medical observer, and he decided he could serve the Air Force better, or the Army Air Force better, by being a doctor in a prison camp, and he was. And so he was my doctor in prison camp, and, uh, and later on, he was a MD, a flight surgeon. He was a captain, Captain Kaplan. Confidence and liberation. Well, I don't know, I guess when you live through some of it, and I just wasn't going to die. And when we evac, I stayed behind in the prison camp, and then the Russians started getting closer, and they got a bunch of us together, and we walked. So I was on the road for, I didn't leave with the main group, but we left with a bunch of guys, and uh, we had... In our area, there was French prisoners of war working on farms, there were RAF or British prisoners of war, and Polish prisoners of war off the front lines in Poland, and we had a group of Russians that were captured right around our prison camp, 
in a pincer movement. And when I left the hospital, I was with about five guys that were in the hospital. And uh, we were sent out to walk. And we marched uh, across northern Germany, across Pomerania and into Mecklenburg. And I was liberated down east of Hanover, where we crossed the Elbe River. And the Russians were kept going away from the Russians. And uh, I was actually liberated by the Americans on April 16th of 1945. We had walked, no, we walked about, uh, I think we walked about 500 miles over 60 days on the road. No more marching and liberation. I walked uh, on that march across Germany, and that was probably the worst part was on this march because we didn't have too much to eat. And then uh, they hauled us across the Elbe River, and the Americans came up on the west side of the Elbe River. And uh, the Germans were going to, they marched some of the guys I was with north, and I told them I wasn't going to march anymore because I could hear them shooting down there. and I somehow or other knew it was the Americans, and I said, hell, I'm not going to march anymore. And I went over to another barn, not, not the one I was staying in, because I knew they'd look, and they, I hid in a hayloft way back under the roof, because these guys had to, the guards went through, and as they were sticking their bayonets in the hay, but I was back under the roof, and then I stayed there about two hours after the people marched out and then I came out and um, it turned out the Americans came up that whole time and they were shooting and, and so I uh, was in this German house this woman knew that the war was getting to an end and she was I was sitting at her table in the Get, having a supper or something, so I suppose it was potatoes and bread, but, uh, and we could hear a shooting down in the town below, and we knew it was Americans, and, because uh, we were on the other side of the Elbe River, the west side, and uh, the British boys that had been captured at Dunkirk, they were medics, and they'd stayed as prisoners for all us, three or four years and they marched they walked down to this American place because I was still not able to walk too well and they said hey there's an American POW an Air Force kid that had been POW up there and the, the Americans sent a group of people the three uh, guys with the 5th Armored Division were spearheading the 84th Infantry Division and they guys come into town with a jeep that night and I was sitting at the table of this woman's house eating a supper. She was, well, they knew they were losing the war so she was giving us something to eat and uh, so I said, well, I gotta go back and get some supplies. These guys came into town with a jeep and said, you gotta get up and go out right now. I said, well, I gotta go out to this barn and get some of my souvenir type of thing. I had some old cans and stuff that I kind of picked up across Germany and they said, no, there's a German tank right out there across the street in that copse of trees and we don't think he's going to give himself away by shooting at a jeep, but we're not taking any chances. Get out in that jeep and whew, off we went and I was liberated. I was with the American troops, the 84th Infantry Division. Uh, down in a little town about six miles down the street, down the road. Food rations on the forced march. Not much. We get a bread once in a while. We had some bakers, but the Germans themselves were short of food. And uh, uh, I guess you'd say mostly I lived on potatoes, raw potatoes or cooked potatoes. And that's about all, they, all we could get our hands on. The forced march mortality rate. Well, my, my group, we didn't lose anybody, except because our, our group was, 
was kind of held down. And we had a bunch of Russians marching with us. And one of the Russians, uh, the only guy we lost was this one Russian. And he, there was a big bottle of white gasoline that they'd used to thrash, which they thrashed inside. And he thought it was vodka and he drank it. And the next morning he got up, he was sick and had thrown up and stuff. And uh, the Germans went in and guards and shot him and threw him out of manure pile. That's the only guy we lost that I know of. The Russian government's position on Russian POWs. Well, the Russians' position was that if you were a prisoner of war, you were a traitor because a Russian is expected to fight till he gets killed. And if he didn't get killed, he must have surrendered. And if you surrendered, uh, you're considered a traitor. So uh, we had a group of Russian POWs that were marching with us. And uh, a lot of those guys uh, we, we kept on moving across the Elbe River, and those guys, uh, I, think they, I think the Russians that were walked with us, though, were separated from us before we got to the Elbe River, a little town, our town called Parkim, and they were put in a work party, and because uh, they became slave laborers, and then the Russians got up to the Elbe River, so they were probably liberated by their own people, and I, I really don't know what happened to them. They were sent back to Russia, and I've heard that some of them were executed, but I don't know. I mean, this is just hearsay. The homecoming, a military service stateside. I was well treated when I got home, and uh, uh, they were going to, uh, I thought, well, I'll get out pretty quick, so I, no, I, I couldn't get out because I only had been prisoner for a short time. And at that time, uh, I went out, to, I had my 60-day leave at home after there because I'd been a POW. And then I was sent to Santa Monica, California. And the war was ending about then, but I didn't have enough time in to get out. And uh, there you had to, you couldn't get out unless you'd been a POW for uh, a year or longer. And so I said, well, hell, I'll, I got beat out of, I didn't go on my mission, so I'll go into a, a B-29 outfit. Well, while I was on the road from there to Denver, from uh, Santa Monica to Denver, going across uh, Arizona, they dropped the first atom bomb and then after I landed in London, they dropped the second atom bomb and the war ended and I said, well, hell, I no won't get to combat anyhow. So I transferred to Army, Long Beach Army Airfield. I had a ling an aunt that lived in Long Beach and so uh, at Long Beach and then all of a sudden I worked in air course uh, supply aircraft out of control, out of uh, commission for parts and I, my job was to dig up these parts someplace and <clears throat> the depots and stuff to get those airplanes going back. And then, then they came out with a rule that if you'd been POW for 90 days or longer, you're eligible for discharge. And then, uh, so I got my discharge out of Long Beach Army Airfield. Remembering victory in Europe or VE Day. And I remember V. VE day, I was in the hospital at Kingman Army Airfield. And I was thinking my brother was in a medical group, but he was in a field hospital unit, and it happened that he landed on Utah Beach with, on D-Day and set up a field hospital right on the peninsula there, the French area. The Americans landed on Utah Beach, there were Omaha Beach, and. Utah Beach. I had a cousin that was an ambulance driver landed on Utah Beach, and I think my brother landed there with the 57th Field Hospital. The atomic bomb. Well, it was it was 
really news to me. We didn't know anything about that. Uh, they, they dropped the first one on the road when I was going from Santa Monica to Lowry Field, and then the second one was dropped while I was at Lowry, and uh, one was at Hiroshima and one is at Nagasaki, and we found out that it just wiped, wiped them out, and uh, we didn't really have any television in those days. It was just the radio reports, and that's when I knew they, they closed all the combat training groups down and the, the war ended, so the Japanese surrendered. Best memory of the war. I guess probably the day I was liberated. Reuniting with Dr. Kaplan after the war. At the University of Minnesota after the war, he went back and was taking graduate work in psychiatry. And he became a psychiatrist here in the Twin Cities. So, and he was an MD already, but he was taking graduate work in psychiatry under the GI Bill. And so he ran me, he said, well, as part of my thesis and all that, I want to interview you. And he interviewed me again, and he knew some of my story because he'd uh, left the prison camp and I'd stayed behind in the hospital. <clears throat> and then he left a little earlier, a later, with a contingent of people from <clears throat> the hospital. I had written to him and he wrote a, certi a certificate as to my injuries because he'd vividly remembered because of my story. Then he recertified my disability and so I got under the GI Bill, or I, I got uh, my four years in at the university. Disappointment. Well, yeah, I, I'd passed the test for cadets and I felt disappointed with that, but after I was a member of the air crew and, the, uh, and even though uh, six of our crew were killed and <clears throat> only three of us got out, I felt that that's what I was trained for and that's what I wanted to do, uh, is to, to do these things and, uh, and I felt kind of gypped out of it when I was only in England, uh, you know, these 19 days or something, and uh, so uh, I, I really want to do something, so I, but then when the war actually ended with, the, again, I was going to the, to Lowry Field, and the first atom bomb was dropped in the way, and then the second one was dropped while I was there, and I thought, well, the hell with it, that's it, and the war ended. Wesley C. Borgeson passed away on April 30th, 2015, at the age of 89. His humble military history and valor live on here at Air Combat Journal. If you enjoyed this show and would like to see more like it, please subscribe to this channel. Subscribing will encourage me to get more of my 200 interviews out, as well as improve my YouTube analytics. Thank you for watching, and I welcome your comments.